thank you to panelists Scott, Mihaela, and um, Patrick for joining us. So I hope everyone is safe and well. Um, two out of three of you are battling out the weather up, up north, so thinking of you all there. If I may, I'd like to begin um, taking questions in the order of Michaela, Scott, and Patrick. And if I can, Michaela, I'll open the session with you. So Michaela, you've done a lot of work on food security, which we all understand has been a major concern for Chinese policymakers um, and often creating demand for products coming from the West. Is this still the case today? And to what extent do you see these different drivers um, affecting China's current food policy? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, uh, Courtney, for the for the introduction. And um, yeah, it's actually a very interesting question to look at that um, changing relationship between food security and imports. And I guess a good starting point here is to unpack what food security really means in the Chinese context. So China's traditional thinking insists that the stability of the state must rest on the food bowls of ordinary citizens. So that is to say food security is of prime concern, is a, is a key priority. And traditionally, that food bowl used to contain predominantly grains. And uh, this is something you can actually see when you look at, it's a point that's often been made, but when you look at the term for food security in Chinese, it actually translates as grain security. So in the early decades of the reform period, food security targets would focus on staple grain production. And so China has achieved, I think, quite a remarkable increase in domestic grain output over these past decades as it was opening up and developing, even though that um, increase has come with a hefty environmental price tag. But at the same time, China is obviously a dynamic society and there we're seeing a lot of changes. And so we also saw diets beginning to change. Mm -hmm. So with um, you know, decades of um, economic development and massive wave of urbanization and the emergence of an increasingly affluent and aspirational middle class, we saw a massive dietary change away from what used to be a starchy staple grain, staple based diet diet towards a more Western style diet, one can say with, uh, you know, more consumption of animal proteins, more diversified, more high quality foods. So that means that the food bowl today is not the food bowl that, that, that Chinese policymakers were thinking of in the 1980s or 90s, 90s. The food bowl today contains not only staples, but a greater variety of food, including growing amounts of meat, various types of meat products, dairy products, vegetables, fruits, seafood, and so on. And now if you look at actually the driving force behind China's imports, which have been increasing, China has been a net importer, I think, ever since the mid 2000s, then you can see that it is really this dietary shift that's been the driving force behind those imports in a twofold way. On the one hand side, the grains that China imports are mainly feed grains, so they are there to feed the growing animal population. So they're not there to feed people, they are there to feed, they are being imported to feed animals. And then of course, you're also seeing a growing inflow of higher value consumer oriented products, various frozen and chilled meats, dairy products, uh, packaged high quality foods and so on. And so while China has been quite successful and able to ensure grain security, it is actually that dietary shift that constitutes the real challenge to what it means to provide uh, food security. And today it really means imports are part and parcel of China's food security because given the, the resource constraints um, China faces, it is not uh, possible to maintain both the population and the large animal, uh, the, the large livestock population and to provide these diversified foods of, of the resources that China has at hand. And so right now, of course, we are in a very particular situation, a very volatile, uncertain international environment. We've seen disruptions from COVID-19. We've seen international political tensions. And there is a lot of skepticism towards the international market and Chinese policymakers are pivoting back with a stronger focus than ever before on self-reliance, mm -hmm. but imports remain a reality. And so Beijing's issue today is no longer whether to source essentials from abroad, but to, but to determine what these essentials are and how to maintain supply chains on terms that are favorable to Beijing. Thank you. 
No, absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, and if I may, Scott, I'll take another question sort of looking at the general political environment. Um, it's been well reported that China's economic coercion has been targeted towards Australian products, um, just as James had mentioned in the introduction, to include barley, wine and lobster, for example. Um, going along just as the relations between both Australia and China have been plummeting and plummeting. Extent, have these products actually been impacted by these you know, new economic coercion methods used by Beijing? And on the flip side, what has this meant for the products that are not targets of punitive measures? So if I may, Scott. Yeah, thanks, Courtney. Um, so the Chinese trade barriers on Australian exports from 2020, 21, were targeted at least nine different commodities, and two of those were minerals, coal and copper, and a set seven other agricultural commodities. So agriculture is a target of that coercion, as you say. And if you look at the trade data um, that resulted from this from the trade barriers, um, those commodities were worth that, that were subject to barriers were worth about twenty billion Australian dollars. Mm. And that total trade ground to a halt, so down to virtually nothing except for some beef still getting in. That $20 billion of product was diverted to other countries through trade diversion, and, in fact, it increased probably another 50%, so an additional 5 to $10 billion. So the net aggregate impact of, uh, well, um, the conditions that arose out of the coercion was that Australian exports were ahead five to ten billion dollars. So, in aggregate, you can say that the the impacts of the coercion have been low. In fact, we've come out of it incredibly well. And there's at least a couple of reasons for that. The most important is just because of the nature of the Australian export sector. Um, that we export bulk commodity, agricultural commodities, resources, um, that we're internationally competitive in the production and export of those resources because we have an open trading regime, we've been subject to competition, we've got world-class research and development systems. So if you can't sell to one country, China, there's plenty of other countries in which we're competitive. So... This, this episode has shown really our resilience to coercion. And the other factor is that it just so happens that over that period, 2020 to 2021, we've had um, extremely good seasonal conditions, widespread rainfall across most of Australia, so the crops have been good and the prices have been going through the roof record prices for virtually all of those agricultural and resource commodities. So that's another reason um, why the, the, the net result has been good. So if you're looking at this, like from an um, aggregate level, the costs have been low. But, of course, there have been costs because if China was still in the market, then prices would be even higher. So there's an opportunity cost from those barriers. <clears throat> And there's been work done on that. Um, ABES, the Australian Bureau of Agriculture and Resource Economics and University of Adelaide and other has estimated that the costs, for example, to barley um, was rough, would roughly be about $250 million after a five-year period, after all the diversion effects and a new equilibrium has been reached. And for wine, it was about $220 million. So, there are real costs from the coercion. Um, and I guess there's just a question of whether those sort of costs are high or not. And a quarter of a billion dollars sounds like a lot, but the GDP of Australian agriculture is about 70 billion. And it's going to be a lot higher from last year and this year because of the seasons and prices. So in, in context, the overall costs still are modest and in terms of Australian GDP or for the average, you know, Australian taxpayer, there it's a it's an account, it's really a rounding error, very small costs in aggregate from Australia. 
but if, but there's that varies. I think is what you're getting to in in your question. It varies by sector, by industry, and commodities. So they felt them in different ways. Wine and lobsters um, more heavily than the bigger commodities, um, and less less direct impact for the more widely traded commodities. And it, it varies. For example, in, we've we've got uh, Patrick Hutchinson here, but for example, in in beef. You know, after years of drought, Australia's had good seasons. So farmers are restocking, which, you know, is a supply constraint, which means prices increases. And all my mates and my family and cattle are pretty happy with the prices and I'm sure they're not worried at all about uh, the Chinese barriers. Um, but precisely because of those conditions, the, uh, the exporters, the abattoirs that, that Patrick represents, are doing it hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and it... And as another example, for example, uh, timber. So Australian logs were subject to biosecurity barriers to get into China. And for the industry as a whole, it didn't have a large effect for large diameter logs. You can sell them anywhere, and including in Australia's booming domestic building industry. But for small diameter logs, it had a big impact. So that's what's generated from the thinning of forests, and China took virtually all of those. So that's had an impact, especially on the contractors that do the thinning of forests. <clears throat> um, and one of the ways around that, by the way, then is instead of selling logs to China, that it's chipped into wood chips and exported to China anyway. So these markets have a way of reaching a new equilibrium and a new level, but the impacts vary enormously by sector. Um, But overall, you know, I think we can pretty safely conclude the lesson from this, that the overall cost to Australian agriculture has been pretty modest. Thank you for such a detailed answer, Scott. And you know, for you, Michaela, taking us with a very broad macro view. Patrick, if I may, just to focus this down, um, Scott's kind of tilted his hat, tipped his hat at this already. Um, but the questions about um, the Aussie meat processing facilities that have seen their market access denied to China um, over the last two years. How has this really been felt? Um, and how has this really affected the Australian meat exporter um, industry? And to what degree has the sentiment towards doing business with China changed across the industry? And if I may, just before we flip to you, Patrick, just add one more um, small question coming in from another participant, Terry Sim, um, asking questions about two lamb plants who have voluntarily stopped exports to China early in the pandemic after staff were affected. Apparently, they've not been able to resume shipments due to state, um, due, to, due to the state of the Australian-China relationship. What will it take for this relationship to right itself before these plants can resume their exports to China? So if Patrick can s- turn into that question too, and then we'll flip that back to also Mihaela and Scott on that note. So Patrick, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. And um, yeah, Terry has asked me that question a few times already, so I'll attempt to answer it um, uh, throughout the, the, this answer here. So, look, yep, we've got 10 establishments that have been temporarily suspended from China. That's occurred over the previous two years. Some of those have been for labelling issues. Some of those have been for residue issues. And some of those have been for COVID-related issues. Um, very different to any other um, agricultural industry in that it doesn't impact the whole industry. It only impacts those individuals that have that individual establishments that are accredited to export to China. So by that, um, you know, I can certainly, um, uh, you know, you, you empathise and, you know, I, I, I do work with um, people like grain growers, et cetera, and, and talk to them about issues in the, you know, their barley has had to be uh, diverted to other markets, whereas wheat has gone very much stronger into China. Um, if I look at uh, any of our statistics at the moment on beef, actually, year on year for 2021, our grain-fed beef exports were 66,000 tonnes, and that actually is up 4% on uh, 2020, whereas in uh, for 2021, we only exported 81,000 tonnes of grass-fed beef, but children frozen, and actually is down 33%. So overall, we were down 20%. Um, on 2020 levels. 
which obviously were down almost uh, almost half on 2019 levels. But interestingly, when we look at the balance, when we go to sheep meat exports, which is total, you know, which is the other part of our red meat export overall, we're actually up six percent year on year on lamb and six percent year on year on mutton. So, in fact, we've actually increased over the previous time period um, our exports into uh, China for sheep meat, and it's been our second biggest year on record for sheep meat into China. So, what we can see here is very clearly that there is a, a scenario where tolerances on issues as they relate to establishment listings are increased um, and uh, moving into uh, Terry's uh, question, the answer is the same as I've been giving for the last two years, and that is, you know, our dialogue um, uh, has ceased between, uh, for, for a lot of circumstances on a technical level between China and Australia. So, you know, there's brief interludes when China asks a question and we provide the answer, but then potentially we don't know what happens with that answer after that until such time as they either implement a temporary suspension or, or, or they don't. So um, later on this afternoon, I'm chairing the China-Australia Red Meat um, Alliance Group, um, and that is uh, the Australian Meat Industry Council and the China Meat Association with a number of other key individuals, both in Australia and in China, including Bright Foods, all talking about you know, our relationship, what we're doing as far as um, our production levels, information about our systems, et cetera. So we still have the relationship. China still underpins uh, record sheep meat prices, uh, lamb and mutton prices that you see, um, and China still imports 150,000 tonnes of Australian beef. So if we look at, um, and that's at our, you know, sort of what potentially could be classed as our lowest uh, at lowest ebb in the overall um, geopolitical relationship that we have. So it is obviously never ideal for someone to be suspended from a market, but I think we also should just take a breath in some circumstances here. We do see great future in China as we move towards, um, uh, you know, improved relationship. We have strong relationships with China on a business-to-business level and an association-to-association level, as I've just said. And, you know, this is not the first time that governments, or sorry, markets and countries have implemented um, such actions. And our strongest ally, the US, uh, only 20 years ago, uh, or a bit, bit over 20 years ago, was going to implement a very hefty tariff on Australian land exports to the US under the Clinton administration. So please do not think that there is a scenario out there where China is an island and it is the only one out there that implements such things. We still have issues in regards to putting uh, rendered product into Indonesia. We have halal constraints that we have to deal with across the world. We have issues in relation to um, you know, how we manage as we go forward with the UK FTA and the EU FTA. Um, and, you know, places like Malaysia is an example with the Asia Society. We have three different FTAs with Malaysia, yet it's still, you know, an annual uh, rigmarole and, and struggle to be exporting into that market. So this is not just, you know, a, a scenario where the media plays out China v Australia. This is a scenario where we deal with, this, with these impacts consistently, all the time across Australia's biggest agribusiness export being red meat, and we will continue to do so. But again, as I said, uh, we still have a very strong foothold in the market, and um, anyone who talks to you about diversification, always remember we can diversify for volume, but we can never diversify for value. So no matter what products that we are sending around the world, Inevitably, what we saw with China is that they can either underpin livestock price on their own in Australia, or they can they provide a very large amount of opportunity to underpin that price. And certainly, they do that with sheep meat. So, they are a valued uh, uh, friend to the Australian red meat industry, and will continue to be. Uh, and our role is simply to ensure that when they have questions, we have answers. But we think as the relationship improves, we'll be able to improve that dialogue, which we're doing at a business-to-business level.
as we speak. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, for a very thorough answer and for really giving us some actual context that's deeper than what the headlines telling us about the plummeting relations, um, a little bit more detail there and a different perspective for sure. I don't know if Scott and Mahela have anything that they'd like to add on this particular theme. No, that's fine. Thanks, Scott. All right, perfect. Well, then, Mihaela, if I could turn to you um, and to just link back to some of the themes that you've all been talking about. Um, I'm very curious to learn more about how easily has it been for China to find replacement import markets for agricultural goods um, following the Australian market access denials? Um, which other countries and products have also encountered these restricted market access for agricultural products and food? So to give us, again, a more context based answer for sort of the very specific Australia-China questions we have today. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. So I think um, that's also very interesting to, uh, yeah, to, to look at how that's been played out and how that's been playing out in the Chinese context. And I think one important uh, factor that is working in China's favor is that you usually tend to have China usually tends to have an asymmetry in trade relationships with its trade partners. And what I mean by that is that just by, you know, by definition, by definition, being the most populous country in the world, China tends to have a much larger market being much larger than the countries it is trading with. And that means that for exporting countries, they often tend to be in a situation where they find, where they find China is sort of their ma a major market, perhaps the major market, and they're exporting a sizable a sizable portion of their import of their exports going to China. Now, if you flip that and if you look at it from the Chinese perspective, yeah. that very that very same exporting country might just contribute a smaller amount, a small proportion of what China actually imports for any given commodity. So there is quite an asymmetry here. And that means that China has market power. This market power puts China in a position where it can play off different exporters against um, each other um, and where there's always somebody sort of willing willing to come in to fill the void. And that is something that we've also seen, I think, with um, Australian agricultural goods. So I don't think it was... Um, it wasn't very hard for China to find replacements for these goods. So let's take B, for example. So Australia is, yeah, as Patrick mentioned, facing facing issues and technical trade barriers. So there were several nations right at hand filling the void left by Australian beef exporters, mostly of uh, first and foremost, the U.S. that um, sort of in... Um, in May 2021, I think it was, the U.S. imports surpassed Australian imports for the first time in uh, a long time, in two decades. And the U.S. was uh, particularly benefiting from the China-U.S. Um, phase one trade agreement that had opened the doors again to U.S. To US beef after almost two decades. But there were also other nations filling that gap, for example, South, um, South American nations like Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, who dominate the frozen beef trade, um, sort of the less, the lower value type of beef trade. And we've also seen that happen in, in other sectors, in the wine sector or in the, in the lobster sector. So I think, as I said, this sort of position of market power where you have many exporting nations vying for taking a market share in your market puts China in a position where it is relatively easy, even though it might take some, you know, a little while, but it's relatively easy if China changes priorities and, uh, you know, allows somebody into the market that's been restricted before. It's relatively easy to fill gaps that are left with one um, exporting nation no longer being allowed into the market, as was the case with Australia. Now, I think you also, I think you also, you were asking about who else, if we've seen other, other countries facing similar restrictions. And I would say I haven't really, we haven't really seen many cases where import restrictions were as blatantly used as a tool of political retaliation, one could say, as in the Australian case. But what we do see, and I think um, Patrick mentioned that um, in passing, is um, that we've seen um, market access restrictions related to COVID, to the COVID pandemic. And that's been very interesting. And I think that's something we have to watch out going forward. So I, I think it was in 2020 after the first wave had kind of passed and um, that China established a kind of fully fledged a food import um, system around the COVID around COVID-19. And so the thinking was that um, 
virus might enter through the cold chain. So Chinese policymakers have maintained that there is a concern of coronavirus spreading by importing frozen or cold uh, chain foods. And I'm not a virologist, but I, I, I know that the science behind that is, um, is uh, a bit contested. But nonetheless, China has um, insisted that it is necessary for it to um, to kind of test and, um, um, and and restrict and control imports coming in through the through the cold chain. So what we've seen in the past two years is this really elaborate system that has emerged around controlling COVID nineteen related imports with separate warehouses where cold chain foods are being tested and disinfected and tracked and traced through the value chain as they end up on the shelves of Chinese supermarkets. And of course, um, that has you know led to a number of disruptions. So a multiple 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 times we've seen um, importers or uh, uh, certain or uh, export countries being temporarily banned, bans being placed on individual countries or on individual companies, and um, and those are usually then then lifted as well. But it does mean that um, it introduces compliance risks for those uh, companies exporting into the Chinese market, and the Chinese really treat that as a system that is um, or they it, it links up with. Um, broader food safety concerns, and it's a real concern that's been um, voiced over the past decades to sort of improve these endemic food safety issues that China is facing domestically, but to also improve food safety for imported foods. But nonetheless, this COVID-related uh, import restriction system has given, I would think, it has given customs authorities a little bit of discretion where you, as an exporter, you um, face risks that are beyond your control. You might just be denied access to the market and there's essentially nothing you can do. So it does give customs authorities uh, discretion and leeway to block access to the market for reasons that might go beyond um, the, the pure um, focus on food security and so for exporters that has that is sort of where we've seen most of the trade restrictions emerging or even though they were usually um, short term so these were temporary bans and they were then lifted again after a few weeks in many of these cases. Michaela if I may just ask a quick follow-up question um, just to understand you know what is the effect if any, of the closer China-Russia relationship. We've all seen the news in the last couple of days that Russian access to now export its barley into China has finally come through um, and they've been permitted to make those you know, sales. So do you have any comment there? I mean, of course, bringing you more into sort of contemporary affairs, but I'm interested that you didn't mention Russia as one of these other replacement trading partners. So do you have any quick comment um, to that question, please? Yeah, I didn't mention Russia because it's uh, so so new. So I think the interesting thing is that uh, Russia is, I think, top wheat exporter worldwide, but it hasn't been exporting any wheat into China re until re until very very until three days ago, which was uh, related to phytosanitary concerns. So there was like restrictions placed on Russian wheat coming into the China market because of crop disease concerns. And these were just lifted on the day of the Russian invasion uh, into Ukraine. And now um, if Russian exporters, they have to follow you know, some protocols in terms of food production or wheat production, storage and transportation. But if they do that, then they are allowed now under that protocol to bring in wheat. I, that was particularly for wheat, to bring in wheat into the China market, which was previously restricted for Russian, for Russian exports. So I think that is certainly a way for China to diversify, perhaps also keeping in mind that Ukrainian exports might be affected by what is going on currently there. Um, it is also um, you're perhaps playing into that um, alliance that we are seeing emerge between China and Russia, providing a lifeline to Russia as other countries imposing sanctions. But we'll have to see you know, how far, how this trade is being managed in terms of currency and how this trade is being managed if secondary sanctions would be placed on Chinese companies trading with Russian wheat exporters. Great. Thank you so much, Michaela. Very, um, very detailed answers. I think the real question about where this, you know, strategic partnership is going and in a lot of ways tracking the sudden entry of this product having been held up, you know, for 
months, 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 and months to finally see that move is something very interesting to follow. Um, if I can, turning back to sort of broader strategic concerns, um, to put you back on the spot, Scott, um, that Canberra has filed complaints with the WTO in the more recent months over Chinese tariffs on Australian barley and wine exports. Could you share with us what are the best outcomes for Australian exporters here? And based on your research, do you really think that the WTO has an effective role to play in blunting the use of geoeconomics in trade? Um, yeah, they're quite big questions, and I'm not a trade lawyer. Um, but I've been through the investigation documents and the rulings uh, for China and their, their cases of anti-dumping and countervailing duties on wine and barley. And for, for Australia's appeal, those, those, uh, um, the case to the WTO, on the basis on the, to appeal against Chinese argument that Australia sold those products into the Chinese market at below market price. So that's one thing that Australia has to disprove and that that's damaged Chinese domestic industry. And from looking at detail at prices and quantities and industry structures, I can't see how China is going to uphold that case. And so I, I think there's spurious cases for both, for both wine and barley and trade lawyers that I've talked to have found the same thing. So I think Australia's got a good chance of winning both of those appeals, and that would be a good outcome for Australia to, to win those, those cases. Um, but, of course, that's going to take years, right, uh, partly because you know, of under-resourcing institutional strength of the WTO and, um, you know, possibly up to five years. Um, so that's not ideal. Because obviously, the, you know, well, the ideal is outcome is that Australia gets access back to the Chinese market. If that takes years, that's not going to happen. So I guess another positive outcome from that would be then that Australia has time to go through this process of market adjustment and diversification over that period. And I think that'll happen. Well, it is, it is certainly happening because of the initial shock and you'd imagine that those structures, trade patterns take or can take a while to change, that they will be in place for when those cases are ruled on. So I think there are positives in this for Australia, There's possibly good outcomes. And at the same time, you know, I think it's even that outcome, China losing that case um, would be acceptable to China because I've, writ I've written papers arguing that, well, one of the objectives of the Chinese barriers was a coercive objective to change Australian foreign policy and policy towards China. And the other objective is for domestic purposes, um, as Mikhail has been talking about. And in the, the case of Bali, it's to, it's to diversify supply away from Australia. There were years where... Australia accounted for 80% of all China's barley imports and nearly 60 to 70% of all barley supply. And that is unacceptable to China. And so that's, a, that's those domestic reasons are one of the reasons why they've, they've imposed the uh, anti-dumping duties. And, and for wine, it's more of a protectionist objective that China has a big wine industry um, and that was being flooded with better Australian wine. And so, you know, and I guess this comes down to the, uh, you know, the, um, the question that you posed, that you posed, is WTO an instrument, you know, to deal with geoeconomic pressures or coercion? Well, not really. It's, it's to deal with normal trade disputes, trade distortions, um, and not so much with coercion, Although there's other institutions being developed to do that, so Europe, the EU, for example, developing an, a draft of an anti-coercion um, legislation. The challenges there, of course, is as we were just talking about, it's very difficult to disentangle what is coercion, what is normal protectionism, 
when it goes to court. And I, I understand that that's some of the reluctance for other countries to join in uh, to those anti-coercion measures, in which case, you know, we're really left to market instruments to manage this coercion. And as I was outlining before, Australia's been pretty effective at doing that. Great. Well, thank you, Scott. And I think exactly sort of figuring out what is economic coercion versus typical run-of-the-mill trade issues, I think that really is where the money is. Um, and understanding exactly how these things operate and when they operate and under what conditions is, again, part of the larger you know, studies, questions that we all face. Patrick, if I can, just following along the same line of questioning, um, from the perspective of Australian exporters, you know, what is the meat industry's attitude towards engaging the WTO regarding unfair trade practices? Do unfair trade practices encourage exporters to seek alternative markets? What's your take? Yeah, thank you. And um, uh, look, it's going to be a pretty, pretty quick answer because uh, certainly for our industry, uh, from a WTO perspective, um, due to the fact that it's establishment by establishment, we really don't get that opportunity to be able to present something there. So, um, you know, and there are different issues at different establishments, which is the reason why they get a temporary suspension. Um, but I think more broadly, what we probably should start to really think about is that I, I think that we get wrapped up in, in issues um, that ensure that somehow or other we've got to, you know, give give China's government a kick or give our government a kick, which is not what we're not what is going to get uh, obviously an answer to anything that we're trying to move forward with. Um, we have a very strong relationship with our government, with David Little Proud as Ag Minister and with Dan Tian as Trade Minister. And uh, very clearly, you know, they talk to us about the relationship. They know the issues. They know the scenarios, but they also are, you know, are in a difficult position in regards to certainly the over, you know, the more broader geopolitical issue uh, with China. I think Michaela certainly gave a very, very good overview about uh, great examples of where China is now taking Russian Russian wheat. Um, you know, no coincidence. But um, I, I think that you know what this shows us is that we can be collateral damage in this in, in this process. And, you know, I've said that publicly for a number of years. But I think also we need to take a breath. We need to, you know, look at how our politicians are trying to manage this situation. It isn't easy in any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, David Littleproud put out a press release this morning saying, you know, 2021... Uh, receipts from agriculture are going to hit over 80 billion in in, in net value. So it's not like uh, we as an industry are, are going backwards. So I think we've got to really start looking at the individual examples, which is what Scott provided. But I think more broadly, we've also got to recognise that we are a global player on the agricultural export scene. And we are very dominant in some areas, certainly around red meat. Um, you know, and for, 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 for an industry, for a country that produces, you know, on a world production level, quite a small amount, um, we export a very large amount that happens with grain, that happens with timber, that happens with um, uh, uh, horticulture as well uh, and, and dairy. So, um, you know, in all of these circumstances, the real thing for us is the fact that those, for want of a term, receipts, two-thirds or more of what we produce, we export. So that is the reason why you see those sensitivities coming to the fore. But certainly uh, as, a, as a total industry, Australian agribusiness, um, you know, you know, we don't want to be in a position where we're asking governments to change principles or, or feel as though they need to answer, um, answer questions uh, that potentially they would feel that the broader community wouldn't want them to, to, be, uh, to be engaging with. So really around diplomacy, the key component's got to be that um, uh, we look at how well we're doing in China at the moment in some areas, where we've lost, and start looking at where we've lost to then work out, you know, how do we then make those improvements? Those improvements may never come back. And certainly from uh, our point of view, the loss of, um, 
uh, our beef uh, uh, beef exports into China has been taken up by our um, uh, our wonderful partner US. So again, you know, um, for all of the geopolitical discussions we have, if we lose um, market share, it's not another potential rogue nation that takes our place. This is, in fact, our overall global partners that take our place. So, you know, in all of that balance, you know, being a politician trying to sort all this out, whatever side of the house you're on, is extremely difficult and fraught with danger. And so I think that we also need to probably turn around to our own politicians and look at the issues that they have to face more broadly and start to look at um, how we operate within, uh, not just how we operate within China, but more broadly about the issues overall about um, agribusiness and agribusiness exports and that the future in China still is is maintained and it, it does have a maintenance level. Um, but then look at, you know, how do we improve and where can we improve? Um, but then how do we then look at other markets? And, and that's being done. So I think, um, you know, we're not all here all the time to, you know, give a kick to the government. I think, you know, we've also got to recognise there are some exceptional difficulties in, in managing this and, and, and that uh, we've got to then work towards, you know, plausible and better solutions. Thank you so much, Patrick. And I think for someone who says that you know, there's concerns about collateral damage, you offer you know, a very sober, um, feasible way forward to try and work our way back out of this corner. If I may, I'd like to ask the sort of last targeted question to Michaela before I open a general question to the floor. So just to let the speakers know what's coming. Um, Michaela, I'd like to ask you a more China oriented question that we understand that food security has been identified as a key part, a key component of national security in last year's um, five year plans, so the 14th five year plan put forward by Beijing. Um, what does it mean to be self-sufficient in today's China? And what will this mean for agricultural imports and China's own domestic agriculture market? Yeah, thanks for the question. That's what we spent quite a lot of time thinking about and wondering. Um, so yes, as you as you said, um, it's it's actually I think um, not the first time that food security is mentioned as a pillar of national security, but it's definitely coming to the fore and um, is being made more prominent in policy announcements and also in the plans and blueprints that are coming out. Um, and I think um, the way the Chinese policymakers think about food security being part of national security, I think there are two interesting aspects to that. The first is obviously the external aspect. And I think the, traditionally, the Chinese leadership is a bit wary of international food markets, um, but more recently, with I mentioned that before, with COVID-19, political tensions and so on, um, there is quite a bit of skepticism around um, over-reliance on import and trade. Uh, so um, the fear really is, the concern really is that food could be used as a foreign policy tool to undermine China's interests. And you may think of that whatever you like, whether that's you know logical to you or you think that's not a concern, but for Chinese policymakers, it certainly is a concern. And um, Xi Jinping said that very clearly at last year's Central Economic Work Conference that kind of sets the tone for macroeconomic development, where he said something along the lines we must not let others become a choke point. I think he mentioned he's, he used the word choke point for the basic national survival issue of eating. So there is clearly this um, um, idea that in a sort of from China's perspective, increasingly complicated um, international environment, you don't want to be over reliant on one source of imports, otherwise it might affect your national security interests. But there's also an, an interesting internal aspect to that, which is, of course, the idea that food security is foundational for internal social stability. So, and that's been something that's been around, that's been, you know, consensus for policy consensus for a very long time. And it's becoming, it's coming to the fore, particularly this year with um, the 20th Party Congress in November. And so the party really in government, they really want to forestall any kind of public debate about food shortage or rising food prices. So you, food security has always been um, important and has always been tied to national security in that sense of providing social stability, which is basically um, the basis and which legitimizes um, the party in, um, in China. 
Um, what does it mean? I think you asked, what does that mean then for both agricultural imports and domestic um, agriculture? I think it's really these two um, components that you need to look at and it has implications or being self-sufficient has implications for both these components. For the domestic market, um, this push towards more self-sufficiency has obviously meant boosting productivity and output. And that has been reinforced or re-emphasized in, uh, in most of the 14 five-year plans that, we have come, uh, that we've seen come out um, concerning agriculture that has been emphasized again in the number one document that just came out um, a few days ago, which provides a blueprint for agricultural development going forward. So there will be a lot of pressure on fulfilling a higher a high output targets, more pressure on grain producing provinces to achieve these targets, responsibilizing or bringing in local government responsibility, holding them to account. But of course, China has always looked towards technological solutions to boost um, productivity. So there will be more focus on farmland protection and there will be more focus on um, developing um, seeds, like innovative seeds, high performing seeds. And the crucial thing though, with this time around will be to understand, to see how these increases in productivity can be achieved in a sustainable way. Because as I said in, in the beginning, um, uh, these types of um, output increases that were achieved in the past and that were based on overuse of fertilizer of, uh, on a farmland uh, degradation, these are no longer sustainable. So somehow we will see China moving away from that model and moving towards something that could perhaps be called sustainable int intensification. So increasing productivity, increasing yields, but doing that in a more sustainable way. So that will be the big challenge domestically. And for what does self-sufficiency mean for agricultural imports? Well, here, I think we will see more efforts towards import diversification and opening the market to more suppliers. That's not really new, that's been tried before, and it has had varying degrees of success. It's been proven quite uh, successful for uh, fruits, vegetables, diversified foods, where we are seeing, you know, lots more imports from BRI countries and ASEAN countries. But particularly for grain and feed security, it's been difficult for Beijing to find um, or to replace its conventional commodity suppliers, like these big exporting nations like US, the US, Brazil, Australia, Canada, France, to really replace them using, you know, a bunch of smaller BRI partners and the Ukraine crisis um, introducing new volatility into the market, into global agri-food markets, certainly will not make that any easier. Thank you so much, Mihaela, for a very detailed answer. I mean, really fascinating stuff. Um, and if I may, I'd like to turn to the last question now in closing, and I'm going to ask each speaker to take really just one minute because we're running a little bit close to the end of the clock here. I will ask the speakers to go in order of Patrick, Scott, and then Michaela, so give you a moment to catch your breath there. Um, and if I may, I'd just like to ask you like a lessons learned question. What lessons can be learned for Australian businesses given the tensions, um, the questions of economic coercion, um, questions of sort of trade barriers? protectionism, what can be learned from going through this experience, this you know, rather turbulent period um, for export, for Australia-China re relations? And I think to build off the question asked by Ben Scott from Bloomberg, are we really thinking about going into a more strategic position where you know, Australia is going to be thinking about how to avoid any potential shocks in the future? Are we already seeing that? Or do we believe that, that Australia is resilient enough to handle these issues on a case-by-case -case basis if and when the relationship might turn turbulent again. So Patrick, then Scott, then Michaela, and please just to ask you to take one minute. Thank you. Thank you. So um, uh, answering Ben's question as well as others um, that were put forward, um, our resilience is key. Um, we've got to remember too for us that we also have climatic issues. So we can cycle between drought and flood as at today and then and hopefully some, some nice in the middles. Uh, on the odd, on the, on the off year that we actually get the opportunity to have a, a normal, sensible year with production and also with price. I think that what we've certainly learned is that um, uh, communication is key. And it's not just communication with China, it's also communication with our own government and a recognition and understanding that, you know, these things are not just as black and white as we would like to make out. Um, there are a great amount of greys in there. Our role and responsibility is about feeding the nation and the world and we've got to remember that if we keep talking about agribusiness, 
but it is about mostly food and fibre. So we've got to be remembering that we are feeding the world. It's a non-discretionary spend in a lot of circumstances. And as such, our resilience is based on the fact that we continue to provide a safe product, we continue to provide a consistent product, and we continue to provide a product that in most circumstances people can feel confident that it's going to be what they consume at the same, at, at each and every time, you know, pretty much in exactly the same. And that's what the world is certainly looking for. But what Australia does much better than most other countries around the world is that we can provide from the very highest in value to the very most commercial value. And that's what we do exceptionally better than most others. So I think overall what we need to be uh, also uh, looking at into the future is that we are diversifying our markets, but we cannot then just think that the diversification is the only answer because we've lost more kilos of beef access into China then we will gain from the whole of the UK FTA on its own. So let's not forget that uh, we already have access. It's not about market access. Uh, it's about market longevity. And that is the thing that I'd like everyone to take away today is market longevity across all agribusiness areas is vital for us to continue and, and to thrive. It is not about finding new things each and every time. Uh, perfect. A perfect takeaway to summarize, you know, your perspective on these questions, market longevity. Thank you so much, Patrick. Over to you, Scott. Um, yeah, I'm going to echo a lot of what Patrick said, that um, Australia has been subject to some very intensive economic coercion, probably the biggest case internationally of Chinese economic coercion um, for structural reasons, right? The China wants to change our policy toward foreign interference, South China Sea, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and has imposed enormous trade barriers to do that. So this is a, this is a major structural issue. It's not because of the media treatment, I think, was one of the questions, or because of better diplomacy. It's a structural issue. And <clears throat> the coercion formula depends a lot on the costs imposed on the target country, that's Australia, and the way that we adapt to that. And as Patrick was saying, Australia's been effective at, adapt at adapting because we're agile, competitive, and that's the key. That's what Australia has to focus on, this commitment to open markets and productivity rather than protectionism, for example, for closing the doors on international trade. Um, our resilience lies in our, in our um, commitment to open markets and competitiveness. And I, so what, the lesson is that Australia is resilient because of the nature of our economy. That's the lesson for Australia. I don't know if that's such a big lesson for the rest of the world with different economic structures. Um, and th that's important. It's important to note our resilience for future episodes, you know, if, if these geopolitical sort of forces become more intense or prolonged. And, um, and I guess the other lesson is that, um, you know, China's a big market, it accounts for nearly 40% of Australian exports and including in agriculture, but we don't need to replace China. There's not one other single market, India, Indonesia, UK, whatever, that we need to replace China with. We're going to replace China with a lot of markets. And the world's a big place and, you know, there's major markets throughout our region and Australia's well-placed to, um, to fill those, so we certainly don't need to panic. The costs aren't that high and certainly not high enough to capitulate to Chinese coercion for Excellent. Thank you so much, Scott. I'm glad to hear that there is a vote, you know, for Australia's resilience and market adaptability. Um, Michaela, literally the last minute is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I don't, I think, uh, I mean, I can't really add much to what Scott and Patrick said, and I think they are uh, probably better placed to really spell out what that means for Australia. But what we would say is probably on a sort of also on a note of optimism that um, despite all these um, restrictions and yeah, all the trouble that we've seen, um, uh, demand for high quality uh, safe food um, is going to grow in the, in the in the future Australia does have a reputation still does have a reputation for being uh, a provider of highest quality food 
And so once um, relations get better, I think it will be uh, there will be definitely a market there for Australia, probably a little bit more crowded than in the past with more competitors now being being there. But um, yeah, sort of the, the consumption trends and the, and the consumer shifts that I was talking about point towards the direction where there will be space for Australian uh, food products um, into the future once the harsh talk is being resolved. Well, Scott, Michaela, and Patrick, thank you very much for a rich and insightful discussion. James, I turn the floor back to you.